Hello everyone. First, I'm really, really honored to be here in front of such a great audience. Thank you, Obi, for the, the invitation. And in, in the next few minutes, I will show you why this little fellow, little is really only two centimeters long, don't be afraid, it's not a giant GMO, uh, make, is one of the big solutions to feed the 10 billion people by 2020. Because indeed, in, 20, in 2050, we're going to be almost 10 billion people. These people, especially in the southern countries, uh, get out of poverty, which is really good. And one of the things when they get out of poverty is getting internet, phones, and eating more meat, more meat and fish. So this animal pro they, they are eating more animal protein instead of vegan proteins. So this is leading to really great challenges for the feedstock industries, which has to produce more chicken, more fish, more pigs, more cows to sustain this big demand, which is going up every year and every year. More meat, more animals, meat, more feed to feed these animals. And the point is here about the protein to feed these animals. The first issues we have is the protein produced in the world to feed these animals are really concentrated in, a, in, in one major place, which is America. This is the flows of soya, soya meal proteins, mainly from all South America and North America, going to all Europe and Asia. But we have also the fish meal from Peru and Chile going everywhere in the world. The milk meal uh, here, the, um, the whey meal, we call it, from North America. So it's not really homogeneous uh, distribution. So we're going to have some ge geostrategic issues. You know, Europe is 70% dependent of, of uh, protein importation. We are more dependent in protein than in energy. But we don't speak really about uh, proteins much more on energy. Second point after location is availability. The FAO, United Nations of Food, says all, already by 2030, we're going to miss almost 60 million tons of proteins to feed our animals with the same demand as we have today. So it could be even worse uh, if the simulation is not, uh, no, is not cautious enough about the, the, the demand of animal protein. Could be less if we have more vegan uh, demand. This tension is particularly high in the fish feed industry. Fish feed industry, you know, here is the seafood consumption. In the last decades, is the farm fish, which, which has been growing a lot. The seafood from the, from the sea, it's stable because the stocks are shrinking or getting stable. So for the fish farm, one of the still major feed we use is small fish we catch from here, from this area, uh, from Peru, we call anchovies, and we make a meal. This fish meal, already the last 15 years has de declined. We lost 2 million tons of them, and in the last 10 years, probably more 1 million tons, because the demand is exploding and just the stocks of these fish are reducing because they are not unlimited in the ocean. So with this tension leads, of course, to economical tensions. Here is the price of the fish meal. 500 euros, 500 dollars. A few years ago, 2,500 dollars per ton. This is really huge in the commodities industries. If you, if you can imagine the same for the oil, all will be 500 to 1,000 uh, dollars per barrel today. So it's really, really a uh, uh, high uh, increase, um, and which make a big pressure to uh, the salmon industry, the shrimp industries, the pigs industries that are using this uh, protein meal. So which are the solutions? But what do you have from the field to the consumer? Hopefully, we have a lot of solutions to, to make something more sustainable. First, maybe, will be to use other animal proteins, you know, cow, sheep, they produce a lot of manure, a lot of methanes, so not, not a good conversion of uh, proteins they made. So they, in, the, in the biodiversity, we have a lot of other animals like krill in the ocean, jellyfish, in the soil, insects, worms, they could be eaten. In some countries, people are eating them straight, so they could be a source of direct protein, more sustainable, more efficient. But here is the big issue of acceptance. Would you like to eat jellyfish, worms, or insects? That's a big question. Second point, or some example of company. Second point is consumer, they can eat less animal protein, especially in Western countries, Northern countries. We are eating a lot, a lot of animal proteins. And then we can reduce and eat more vegan 
proteins or single cell proteins, which are bacteria, yeast, algae. And you see there are a lot of companies, especially in California, working on these issues now and trying to provide this, a, a new, um, a new proteins that has some flavor that classical meats to make uh, like a vegan burger or uh, artificial uh, steaks, we call it. But the world will not turn vegan. I mean, uh, our culture, our metabolism, we still need animal protein. So the, the thing is how to make more sustainable the existing animal proteins. The main point will be to recycle all the loss we have along the value chain. 30% of things, the food coming up a field is not going to the gut of someone. We are losing so much already in the world. And this waste could be recycled by the organism we find in the nature that recycle, like the food, li the forest litter, the dead, dead animals, like fungi, bacteria, insects, algae, and try and recover these proteins to give it to these animals and, and make, at the end, reduce the environmental burden of fish, cows, uh, and so on. So many companies now try to invest this area. So you have seen insects are among the solutions. We can really wonder why uh, and why like this basic brownish powder made of insect, which is a very concent protein concentrate. This is our product. It looks really, uh, uh, yeah, really, really basic. Is one probably of the big solution to, to sustain this big demand of uh, animal proteins. So why insect? Because first, it's the first biodiversity in the world. Agriculture has focused only in the last thousand years on plants and animals, which are really li more limited, more than one million species, and we almost don't know anything about them, or very few about them. This diversity, you have a, here a snapshot of this biodiversity. It's a lot of different things, from few micrometers to the biggest insect are 30 centimeters big, very big uh, locust, for example. Um, and this diversity means a diversity of diets, so we can then use them, as I said, to close the loop in this reducing reduction of food waste, like to valorizing green waste, household waste, slaughtering waste, wood waste, sludge. We can find any strategy in insect to valorize anything and close the loops and really reduce uh, this food waste and make more sustainable proteins. The other point is at least small scale insect farming is known. You know about honey. People know how to produce bees. Um, in, in Asia, people are start to farm for a few decades, farm insects also for food. Um, the silk, I mean, is from thousands of years, we know how to produce silk from silk worms. And this is, these little things, very little actually, are cochinillas producing carmine, which is a red pigment you find in lipsticks uh, and in a lot of food uh, products to make these red colors. Um, so we, at least we know how to produce insects at small scale. An insect is part of the natural diet of many, many animals. In, you see in a fish, for example, is 70% of the diet of a trout. 70% in a farm fish of trout is 0% of insect today. And 70% of soya meal, which is not the natural diet. Same for chickens, same for pigs. It's not the same quantities, maybe, but at least they are all eating some invertebrates like insects or worms. And today, they don't, are not using them in the industry. But insects are not only proteins. You see, this is the, the, the small insect I showed. This is a mealworm. It's mainly proteins, but it's also fat, chitins, and other secondary metabolites. So proteins and lipids go for the feed and food application, indeed. But chitin is a polymer similar to the alginate we saw. We know how to produce bio-based biodegradable plastics. So Rodrigo, I don't know where you are, but I can provide you maybe another product for your water bottles. Maybe interesting. Um, and secondary metabolites, you can have antimicrobial peptides, enzyme pigments, which could be really strong new medicines in the future. So the, the potential is absolutely huge. It's like creating today the new chicken industry, the pig industry. So many. Uh, potential market to address. But the, the actual situation is we don't have this product on the market today. You have no processed insect on the market, only we saw the, the, the honey and the, and the silks. It's very, very limited regarding the potential. Um, first, it's because of regulation. 
Here in Europe, we have one of the most stringent regulation, which is good. It preserves the, the consumer. Uh, this is a complicated slide, but it just said, say that you have a lot of regulations, and we cannot use a lot of stuff in substrate. So we cannot do very much the circular economy and closing the loop, as I said before. We are very limited, only plant-based material from the fields. And the market, it is the proteins, only the pet food, only cats and dogs we can feed. All the animals we eat, we cannot, it, we cannot address that market. Even the fish, which is really, really natural. So we are working at European Union level to be able to open this market in the next few years. But it's closing really a market. But this is at least only Europe. The, big, the world is bigger. But the other reason is technology, definitely. This is in Thailand growing uh, crickets, really manual stuff. Uh, in China, growing a small insect for, to, to feed like rodents, birds in the zoos. Um, and this is biocontrol factories you know, to, raise, uh, to rear like ladybirds uh, to, to catch the small aphids and uh, reduce the use of, of pesticides. If we were using the test technology, the quantity of products of insects per year is quite limited. And if we were using this technology and process the insects, the price of the final proteins will be very, very expensive. And remember, fish meal price was about two euro a kilo, and fish meal is already the big, the highest price on the feed on the protein markets. So to reach that, you need really tremendous and disruptive innovation to cut the cost while preserving a high quality standard to be able to produce really large quantities of insects at a good price. So a lot of research is required on nutrition, uh, health application, but really on the equipment of farming and processing equipment. That's why Insect has designed this new concept of biorefinery, which is this in-farm, in four steps, closing the loop by collecting the proper biomass, f farming insects in a new way, processing them after killing, slaughtering, to get proteins, lipid, and chitin for the feed, uh, food, and chemical markets. It's a really high tech, we can see it here. We have a lot of patents behind, a lot uh, pending currently. It's uh, a lot of robotics that handle all the, the operation in the farms. Uh, it's a very vertical way also to produce. Um, it's a really high quality. We have the higher standards in food safety, for example, because this is something very important for our customers. And sustainable because we close the loops, we use very few space, we use very few, it's very um, uh, energy and water friendly, very low consumption. Uh, no antibiotics, no chemicals in the process, and we substitute fish meal, which uh, is better for the ocean's biodiversity. This is our time scale, so uh, we are four founders. My colleagues are not here today. We started in 2012, uh, four of us, first prototypes, funded by two French venture capital uh, to, to a pilot, still running, and now uh, going to we are starting the building of the first big farm in France for the pet food market, the only one we can do in, in Europe, uh, to be open next year because it works, you know, of building a factory takes time. Um, and the next step will be to go more international uh, at a big level when we speak to have a big impact on the food system means producing a lot and a lot. That means by 10 years, we mean to be beyond a million tons of proteins. That means a lot of factories worldwide, from America to Asia through Europe. So that's be behind the team, to fit behind the technology, a team. You see a lot of 30 people, seven nationalities, uh, and a lot of interaction with public labs in France and, uh, and Netherlands. So that's it for the, for the global overview. So, Maybe you have seen the, the, the main challenge we can summarize in our activities. Um, it's innovation, disruptive innovation is quite, uh, disruptive innovation in food is quite rare. Food, food, food technology, agriculture industries are quite conservative because when it deals with food, it's something a bit, a bit scary. People say you are what you eat. So if you eat something different, I am going to be different. So it's the real question you, you, you have in the, in, the, in, in the back. So it's not, it's not common. I mean, the last big innovation in food was GMOs, whatever you think about it. And in some countries, really well accepted. In other, not at all. So how to get good acceptance from our feed industries, using our products to the final consumer, eating a salmon uh, that had eaten an insect, all the regulatory bodies, how to make a room in the laws 
for insects to be able to have business, and also for investors or to convince that we will gonna need a lot of money to build a lot of factories all over the world. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. We are Insect, the Insect Company.